My name is Vichiha Heather. I am the Books and Travel Editor for the News on Sunday. This session is about travel writing, uh, its evolution and future in Pakistan. We are also going to talk about a bit about uh, the lost treasures of Pakistan and the country's leading views. The plan is to talk amongst ourselves for 45 minutes or so and then open up to questions from you all. Um, but let me introduce uh, the panelists first. First of all, we have Mr. Salman Rashid. He is Pakistan's leading travel writer and the author of a number of books. He's a widely travel writer with um, very few places in the country that do not carry his footprint. Fellow of Royal Geographical Society in the UK, he is the only Pakistani to have um, seen the North Face of K2 and has very meticulously traced and documented the trek of Alexander the Great in this part of the world, debunking many misleading but widely believed uh, notions. His books include Teosai, Land of the Giant, Mitty Whispers in the Sand, um, and Sea Monsters, um, Sea Monsters and the Sun God, Travels in Pakistan, among others. His work, explorations, history, travels regularly appear in leading publications on his blog and his travel blog, Ek Musafir Ki Dunya, that he began last year, which is about the history of Pakistan and travel tales from all over Pakistan. Next, we have Zulfikar Ali Kaloro with us, who is an anthropologist and currently works at the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. He completed his PhD in Asian Studies. Uh, we focus on Kalpura history and architecture in Central Kailaza University, Islamabad. His main area of interest is religion and art of Pakistan, especially in Sin. He has also researched in the Punjab, Balochistan, and Gilgit Pakistan provinces of Pakistan of religion, heritage, Sufism, folk art, and Islamic architecture. Kaluru has worked on the representation of women in folk romance paintings of Sin. Apart from uh, Islamic art and architecture, he has also written several articles on Sufism, Hindu, and Sikh um, heritage of Pakistan. His books include Glimpses of Sindhi Heritage, Memorial Stones Tarpakar, uh, Archaeology, Art, and Religion in Sin, and Symbols in Stone, Rock Art of Sin. Our third guest is Mr. Dawid Jahangir, Chairman of Punjab Oil Mills and an avid travel writer whose articles have appeared in major national newspapers including Dawn and the Friday Times. He's the author of uh, the book Travel Companion to the Northern Areas, which is an account and guide to traveling in the northern areas for the inexperienced as well as the seasoned traveler. It, this book is important as it provides a key that designates precise distances and security conditions along with history and social information. 33 photographs showing the splendor of Karakorams and uh, the Western Himalayas are also included in the book. Please welcome our three panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I'll open the discussion with a very generic question that I always think about whenever I think about travel writing. So traveling for the sake of travel um, seems to be hard, especially in a country like Pakistan, where many places are not tourist friendly. And then writing uh, down what you have experienced, describing the place that you have visited and how it affected you is perhaps harder. It's almost like an art form. When did you discover your ability to write about travels? And when did you decide that that was what you wanted to do in life? You can go first, yeah. Um, I don't know, I was a traveler and a very ignorant traveler, I must say. You see, I started out in the army, and like all young army officers, I was very stupid and callow and ignorant. And I used to go traveling around Kari and looking at things. I would never knew what I was looking at. I had no clue about anything. Um, it wasn't until many years later, I left the army in 1978 when I was only 26 years old. Um, I went to live in Karachi and started traveling around Sindh. We, we used to have two holidays in the company I was working in uh, on the long weekend. And uh, I was traveling uh, widely uh, in Sindh, looking at this is still quite ignorant, actually very, very ignorant. Um, 
it was only after, there must have been a storyteller inside me because I met this young woman in PGDC, Tarat Rahim, and she, I, I was telling her a story and I said, you're going to get the story written for your magazine, and she says, no, you write it for me. And I said, I've never written a word in my life. She said, you write your story the way you've told it to me. Rahim was Tarat Rahim. So I wrote my story like that, and that began a very long stint of very extensive reading in a very little known library in Karachi, the library of the Department of Archaeology. And if people ask me where I did my PhD, it was in that library I did it. Uh, so uh, th that's how it all began. Well, what would you like to say? I uh, actually let me uh, uh, say uh, first that I'm uh, following the footprints of uh, Sanman Saab. Uh, he is uh, my guru actually. So uh, uh, it was because of his writings that uh, I went to, to the most difficult terrain, which we call theater, the Western part of Sen. So Sanman Saab was the first uh, travel writer who focused on the western part of Sen and wrote a series of articles, I think, in uh, the news and other uh, leading newspapers. And those uh, articles inspired me to travel to those uh, most difficult, and I must say, uh, notorious for some unspecific reasons. And then I, I started writing uh, on uh, heritage, art, and religion. So my focus was also seen, and uh, particularly the northern and uh, western part. Uh, I brought to uh, uh, limelight the most unknown, uh, I must say lesser known uh, heritage sites of Sen. And when I say lesser or unknown heritage sites of Sen, I'm referring to, I'm referring to the rock art sites. So it was in 2001 that I discovered uh, one of uh, important rock art sites in Kizar. And then uh, my following years, uh, you know, I spent following years in search of rock art from uh, north to the south. And uh, let me tell you the names of the ways where I went to document rock art sites. We call Sita. I think uh, Salman has been there. And he, I think, wrote an article in the news in 1996. And he mentioned three rock art sites. And then I went there, documented, and later on wrote a book. And that book is basically uh, was published by EFT. And it is available online. You so can buy the name of the book is Symbol, Symbols in Stone, the Rock Art of Sin. And that uh, book I mentioned uh, more than I think uh, 50 different rock art are sent. So my focus has always been on uh, heritage sites, religion, and art. So this is a very brief introduction how I basically, uh, you know, got inspired uh, from my Bruce's work, and then I started to writing uh, and reading these uh, papers. Idea was to, you know, when you write a book, very few people uh, read uh, academic. Uh, type of research. So in order to popularize and publicize them, I started writing for uh, the news, Dom and the Times. Thank you. Uh, Thahir sir, could you also please tell us uh, something about uh, Mani and Gandhi's uh, new book? Sure. I mean, the first book? Because? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, they say that curiosity kills the cat. But this cat, you should be happy to know, is still alive. I am just happened because of my curiosity. I'm just curious to go and see the roadside things. What are they like? How do people live there? What sort of creatures, what sort of scenery do you see? So I mean, for me, travel has always been the journey itself. I mean, you know, just to travel by itself is a pleasure. The, this art, the, the fact of discovering some things. And uh, I personally feel that, uh, I don't agree with the idea that when travel is difficult, when travel conditions are difficult, it's not so pleasant to travel. Well, you sit in the bullet train and arrive at the next stop. What's the big deal? It just happened in air conditioning. Uh, car, air conditioning seat. 
or you sit on a plane and you arrive at the other end. The fun of it is to go from step by step to see the topography change, to see the people change, and then face the difficulties of travel, which are all, which are really not all that bad. It's the unexpected. You may not get the food you want, but fine, we'll make do with what you get. So I personally think that travel by itself is, uh, is a wonderful hobby or a pastime. And I have always enjoyed it uh, since my student days. And then um, when the Friday Times started getting published, I said, could I please write the travel piece? And they said, yes. We just been to their side. This is about 40 years ago. There were no uh, roads up there that was left to keep track. And it was difficult to stay on the top. And we did. It was a lovely experience. So I think, um, and you know, that I rotate a lot of people that way. It gives you a tremendous high when somebody in a, at a dinner or at a gathering says, oh, well, I like your piece and I like it. For me, that's not. And that's why I try. Um, please tell us a bit about the new book of yours, Money and the Gunnies. Well, Money and the Gunnies is uh, just a production of the pandemic, actually. Um, when the pandemic hit, uh, I have always wanted to write this book. And uh, since you're not supposed to go anywhere and do anything, I am lucky to have a small house up in Dumaguit. So I ensconced myself there and I wrote all about these three, this range of hills where people travel to for their short holidays and then they go back. Uh, they either go back the same evening or they go back at the end of the weekend. They're normally there just for two, three days. Uh, gone are the days of uh, 50 years ago or yesteryear when uh, my parents would shift to Mali for the whole summer. And a lot of other people did that too. And there used to be a summer community up in Nathiagari, in Mali, in uh, Chandragari and other places. And uh, this is how uh, uh, I started writing about it and to get people who come for just a few days to stay on for a bit longer and see more of the year yeah, of the mountains. And then I started researching for it and I couldn't find any history. And what I found was that then uh, before the British arrived in the subcontinent, People, uh, the people from of India at that time, didn't really like the mountains. They didn't want to go up there. Uh, they felt they were jungles and it was difficult terrain. The only people who went up there were either Sadhus or uh, ascetics or uh, Sufis, and they would go there to meditate and to pray and to live in a cave and do the chitta for 40 days or uh, the Hindu the sadhus would go there. And there is a Buddhist monastery, for example, uh, up in Nilan Valley. And similarly, there are a number of places where the uh, Buddhists and the Hindu sadhus would go there. Apart from that, they were just criminals, mafru, as we call it, you know, uh, running away from the law or uh, something like that, and hiding in the mountains. So there was uh, not much, there's no history except for the gazetteers. So I started reading the gazetteers of uh, 1880, 1890, and then to 2005. The British conducted a census in 1995. Uh, 1895. And that's a wealth of information. And uh, you'll be surprised to know that in 1895, the census, Aptabar was not the biggest town of Hazara. It was the second biggest town, and Haripur was the biggest town. The population of Haripur was 10,000. Men, women, and children, all told. And Aptawa was around 7,500 to 8,000, including the 1,000 or so odd sepoys, uh, which were uh, uh, the, uh, serving the British army. So the Galatias uh, got my interest going, and I read most, a lot of the Galatias. And then found a few old uh, books and uh, uh, allusions to it, not entirely the books about Mali, the books about uh, Ravan Bindi district, but uh, 
as our artistry. But there is really nothing much about let's uh, have the uh, For Pani Kerala, there are two books. So um, this is how I started researching and doing the book. The book is basically all about really like a, a history book of this area, which is about one third of the book. And two thirds just to tell you where to go, and not just just the main Pakka road going up to the, the main bazaar, but also tell you which walks to take and how long it takes for the walk, and if you can get any food on it or not, or is there a place to rest, or if you get caught out in the rain, what can you be, what can be done, things like that. So it's a it's a practical book which will give you a bit of anecdotal history. For example, one of the things that I find very marvelous about uh, this part of the world is that at the end of you know, at the end of the 18th century, 18, 1880, the British Raj decided to build the pipeline from Dunagari to Mari. Because in Mari they had a large number of troops stationed there for the summer. And there was not enough water. Dunagari was a good source of water and it was about 500 feet higher than one. So they thought, they thought of the siphon effect that we all learned in school of how water travels from a higher point to a lower point, even though it may have to go to a very low point first and then go up again, but it will still travel. So they applied the siphon effect and they made this 50 kilometer long or 40 kilometer long pipeline. The pipeline goes from the Dungagari tanks and discharges itself on the muddy ridge in the tanks, just, uh, just below the government house. The difference in altitude is 400 feet, 300 feet. Now imagine spending 10 years or 6 years making the pipeline, blasting through rocks, making paths, felling trees, laying all these pipes which you know, must have arrived from England or wherever. And doing all this, and then waiting to see if the cycle is going to work. And imagine the glee of the engineers and the architects to see that, uh, yes, it did. Without the use of any motors, any pumps, the water flew from, uh, what water moved from the Dumagari tanks to the Mari tanks. So the Mari, Mari could now see more to the garrison, the rather population. So, I mean, all this is the pleasures of traveling. Huh. Thank you. Well, tell me a bit about uh, the history and origin of travel writing because I don't think a lot of people know about that and uh, how many areas have been uh, covered as far as travel writing is concerned. Uh, uh, history and origin of travel writing. Uh, you see, I, I keep saying a travel writer is essentially a historian, a geographer, and an anthropologist. Yeah. All of these view because I'm really an anthropologist and a sociologist. And so, uh, uh, our uh, travel writing in Pakistan we did not cover any history. Mm -hmm. And there was no tradition of writing in English, uh, travel writing in English. The only <coughs> um, substantive and substantial work I ever found written in English, incidentally, was by a Colonel Rashid. In 19, written in 1952 and published in Dawn, it was about Ranikot Fort in Sin. You would know of that. Um, to, uh, he spoke, uh, he apparently was a very, very well read person because he spoke of history and how this uh, immense uh, fortification could have been built in Sin. Other than that, the, the traditional Urdu travel writer was uh, not really a travel writer as my friend Khalid. Rasul says he was a Safar Goes Namcha Nehar. He was a travel diarist. I woke up in the morning, I had this breakfast, I left this place, I went to that place, I met so many people, and that was all. There was no history. But travel writing can not be uh, meaningful without having a, a dose of history and geography and, and everything else, essentially. Uh, do you want to add something to Yeah, I agree with what you said that it's not just, uh, you know, uh, you are writing a daily time, Rose Nancha. It's a different, uh, uh, even content is different actually. So, um, uh, 
uh, was, uh, you know, earlier discuss, uh, discussing about uh, the region and, and uh, my focus. So I will again, uh, uh, you know, discuss uh, the region uh, of SIN and particularly a range of topics that I'm, I have been covering since 2000. Apart from rock, rock art, when I was traveling and documenting rock art in uh, Cuba and other parts of SIN, particularly in Karachi, I also wrote, uh, you know, uh, also uh, uh, wrote a book on rock out of Karachi. And it's amazing, nobody uh, believed that Karachi has such a large number of rock art sites. And particularly, uh, as far as Karachi's rock art is concerned, Buddhism is basically the main theme in the rock art of Karachi. So while uh, struggling, I also came across painted uh, tombs in sand. And then uh, I developed interest in uh, documenting and writing about the painted themes on the uh, walls of tombs. Interestingly, uh, majority of themes were those of folk romances. And later on, uh, I wrote a book. The name of the book is Wall Paintings of Sin, from 18th century to the 20th century. So, the stories that I have discussed in that book are Sasi Pono, Soni Mahiva, as we call it in the Soni Miha, Leila Majnu, though it is not a local uh, story, but it came uh, you know, to send through uh, Persian Arabic literature, and even now, Leela uh, Chanisa, and some other stories. So like, after I, the book got published, then I, I wrote a series of articles on those particular uh, painted uh, Roman, Roman themes in uh, Friday Times, as well as in Dawn. So apart from these uh, wall paintings, uh, since uh, religious diversity is amazing actually. Uh, anybody who is uh, familiar with uh, since history and religion, uh, you would be amazed to know that uh, we have a large number of uh, darbars which are associated with Udasi Pan. So, very uh, few people know about the history and development of Udasi Pan in Sen. So, through these writings, uh, which I wrote for uh, reading newspapers, many people contacted me and then inquired about the, you know, the history of Udasi Pan and also about the nine countries, what is the difference between Udasi Pan and how Udasi, Udasis are different from nine countries, uh, or, you know, uh, both are same, or even how would you comment on, uh, you know, Tariya Panthis, and then we have a Seva Panthis, Prem Parkash Panthis. So, this was an interesting actually, debate that I generated, uh, created. So, I created an interesting discourse by writing, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, Friday Times and the news. So, apart from religion, uh, I'll say, uh, the interesting part, which is also is missing, is that is uh, female mysticism. Uh, later on, I will discuss more on fem female mysticism. I am also writing a book up, which will be on the female mysticism in Pakistan. So, uh, if you want to try, then I will, sure I will discuss more if you uh, have a time to discuss uh, about female mysticism. Uh, another important theme that I have seen in travel writing is uh, Sufism and Sufi shrines. Do you want to add a bit uh, on that? Yeah, actually, uh, in Pakistan, uh, when you uh, uh, think about, uh, uh, when you talk about Pakistan, so you know, two, three things come to your mind. In this very civilization, Gandhara and Sufism. So, when you talk about Sin, it is always, you know, called Sin is the name of Sufism. I believe that uh, Punjab is also home to a large number of Sufi, uh, Sufi shrines. So, uh, since not much has been written on uh, Sufi heritage of Punjab, so uh, as far as my uh, study is concerned, I have done extensive research in Sen. Uh, one of my uh, recently published book, hopefully it will be uh, you know, uh, available in the market, is basically uh, Sen's Sufi shrines uh, journey through mystical, uh, mystical landscape of Sen, in which I have discussed different uh, Orders, uh, Sufi orders, so be it uh, Sohrabadiya, Chishtiya, Nakshbandiya, or Kadriya, or various sub-orders 
are different, uh, you know, uh, sectarian affiliations which are associated with these uh, orders. So, uh, you know, be it uh, a Rashid, a Rashid Yasasla, uh, in you know, who, who was founded, which is believed to have been founded by uh, Muhammad Rashid Shah or Rosie Dhani, a Santai Sivizbal Teen So, yes, Sim is uh, very rich and uh, that we know uh, mostly through, uh, you know, travel writers uh, writing, uh, not much by books. So, this is all that I wanted to add as far as Sufism. Otherwise, you can be many people have written yeah. uh, books on Sufism, but uh, not need to be. So now, famously, the only Pakistani you have seen the north side of Kato. This is something that I find very intriguing. Walk us uh, through this a bit. Uh, what does it mean and how it happened? <coughs> In Punjabi, we call it a I mean, <laughs> because uh, no one is a serious trekker. Uh, uh, apologies to you, sir, you're a serious trekker. I mean, <laughs> I've been following all my tracks. I've been trekking for... I would trek you, but not see this. <laughs> uh, um, all my tracks in the last uh, 43 or some years have been on... Um, have followed a historical line. I, 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 I like to say that I've never been where no man has ever been before. I've, been, I've followed very many great people. So this uh, track was uh, in uh, 2006. It was an exploration of the now abandoned Mustaq Pass in the central Karakoram region, known as the Mustaq Karakoram, which went up from Shigar over the Mustaq Pass, down the Safa Lago Glacier, into the Shakskam River, which uh, until 1963 was part of Pakistan, over the Aghil Pass, which was also part of Pakistan. And <clears throat> then on to Yarkand. Uh, after 1963, uh, after the Indian uh, Chinese conflict, Pakistan gave a very wide belt of land to China, and we lost all this region the headwaters of the Shakskam River, the Sarfa Lago Glacier, and the Ali Pass. The border now runs over the, uh, uh, no, it, it runs on the Sarfa Lago Glacier. I wanted to see how, and this route was pioneered by people of Baltistan, and it was it, not by the British or anyone else, like we all believe that that route was pioneered by Shackleton, and that one was done by Shetan, and that one was done by Cook. The Balti people were traveling on this heavily glaciated route about a thousand years ago which is a miracle. They had no snow goggles. Uh, they had no uh, uh, high altitude gear, but they were doing it. And in 1861, Godwin Austin, uh, Godwin Austin, while mapping the uh, Panama Glacier, did indeed meet up with Baltis coming back home from Yakan. I wanted to see how the Baltis used to travel, so I went and the Chinese did not permit me to cross from this uh, unregular, irregular crossing point of the Mustaq Pass. So I went to China and came from that side to the point where, uh, almost to the point where I had abandoned on the Pakistan side. And that is how I saw the uh, north face of Pakistan. No one's ever done the trek. Incidentally, there's a story here in Raskhan. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> in Raskam, which was the last, uh, which was the end of the jeep road on the Chinese side, where we were getting our camels, uh, we sat in this house of the man who was uh, renting us the camels, and uh, um, they, they had been waiting for us for many days. I was delayed because of visa, uh, uh, trekking uh, permit uh, uh, problems. Uh, so we arrived late and the camels had been sent back to the grazing land. Um, uh, someone went out to get them, so we sat there, he served us uh, fruit and stuff, and then he kept looking at me and, uh, and my, my interpreter and guide, and he began talking. 
and uh, I heard the word Pakistan being thrown back and forth. So I asked my guy for how, uh, about what the man was saying, and he says he's very surprised that you're a Pakistani and you've come here. He's never seen a Pakistani before. <laughs> so, so I said to tell the man if he opens a store for cheap trinkets, cheap shoes, cheap radios, see how the Pakistani KPRs end up in glass as well. <laughs> yeah, um, so now, as I was preparing for the session, I could not you know, help but think about um, the absolute role of women in travel writers in Pakistan. Do you think it is so and why? If it's so? I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> Salman can answer this question better. This women travel writers. Yeah, I, I just could not find anyone. Like, or is there any? No, there isn't actually. Yeah, but why, why is it so? Why do you think it's so? <laughs> well, Moni Mosin could have made a great travel writer, a very funny travel writer. You know, uh, so could Jibinu actually. I, I don't know why that's I can name one which is, which has done quite an exceptional job. Uh, I don't know if you read about this. Uh, there was a British woman, I think her name was She, no, no, yeah, perhaps. She's the one who traveled during the, the, the absolute power of the regime of the Taliban in Afghanistan. And she wanted to retrace the, the Alexander's Army's uh, uh, journey through the uh, uh, through the uh, Hyber, not Hyber Pass but North, and uh, she was single. She was in her early thirties or late twenties, an attractive young British woman. So uh, threatened as you can imagine by you know with her surroundings and so on, and absolutely meeting the basic rule of the local Taliban, and yet she would. Uh, go from one village to the other to the third one to the fourth one. Uh, all in, uh, and, and she described it and she said how she did it was that she would go to the local uh, headmaster of the school and say that I spent the night in your house for, for two nights or so on. And then she would request him to hand, to walk her over to the next village and hand, hand her over to the next headmaster. This is how she came down up to up to then Targela and then up to Targela Lake through Koista. So I mean, but that's you would I would call it bravery, somebody would call it stupidity. But uh, I mean, she was laying herself open to uh, perhaps a lot of uh, you know uh, violence. But I think we're talking of Pakistani travel writers. I think uh, there are a lot of English travel writers. On, on Darla Murphy, Irish, the man, who I mean, 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 from 18th to 20th centuries about the funerary art uh, of the province. Similarly, in a recent article, you wrote about the disappearing art of funerary statue making, also called a Gandhavo, I think. Yeah. In the Kalash Valley. Would you talk uh, about that a bit, uh, about what a funerary art is, uh, what it depicts, and what, if anything, is being done to uh, preserve it, to preserve these treasures that are uh, presumably uh, fast eroding. Yeah, I see, when you talk about funerary art, you know, we actually varies from region to region. And even symbols are different from one region to other region. When we talk about Sen, so in, uh, you uh, can uh, see uh, the impressive Chukundi uh, tombs. The symbols on Chukundi tombs uh, are entirely different from those which you can see in uh, Gandhara region, particularly in Haripur what we call Chach Hazara. In the area of Chach Hazara are, are Gandhar mountains. They are like similar uh, tomb stones, but symbols are different. Uh, so this is all that we have in funerary art. So as far as Gandhau is concerned, basically Gandhau is a, is a wooden uh, you know, uh, statue uh, that uh, local uh, artisans or craftsmen 
uh, meek animal just installed over the grave of the deceased. And they believe that this, you know, the soul of that particular deceased person rests in, in the wooden um, state that we call uh, Gantau. So the tradition has died out because, uh, you know, uh, local people used to uh, steal those uh, Gantaus and uh, sell uh, on, on higher prices. Uh, so this is one of the reasons that they stopped uh, making uh, Gantaus. And basically, uh, these Gandaos were made in three ladies of Kailas, uh, Rambur, Bambur, and Biri. So there, there are still a few villages, uh, particularly in Kalashpuram in Rambur, uh, where one can see a few uh, Gandaos or wooden statues, particularly of Pinigi. And I mentioned in the article that the last surviving, uh, the, you know, uh, the only a uh, wooden uh, statue that one can see in uh, Rangur Valley is that of uh, being buried in Kalashpuram. So this is like the, the tradition that unfortunately has disappeared from uh, Kalash Valley. So you all have travelled extensively in the country and stumbled upon many lost treasures. Tell me a bit about the human side of the story interesting stories that uh, you may have come across, uh, any funny stories, anecdotes that you would want to share with the audience? Salman, you can go for the truth. <laughs> I have many stories, but my favorite um, is from since, uh, December 1987, my wife, our friend from Badin, Abu Bakr Sheikh, and uh, he was taking us uh, down south to almost to the coast uh, or at least to the uh, run of Kutch. And, uh, and uh, we had left Badin very early in the morning. I think we had left at about 5.30. It was December. It was still dark when we arrived in this village. Uh, it was about just before 7. And we, I think we wanted to ask the way. And so these people very kindly said, uh, stop for tea and we said no thank you no tea for us but and then somebody said would you like a Mughabi or uh, you know I wasn't a vegetarian then in between I've been a vegetarian I've gone back to my evil ways now so um, my mouth was watering and I said yes sir December and you know a wild duck so he said all right sir my young is done over there and um, we, we waited Half an hour went by, and uh, I we got fidgety, and I said, "Where's the, where's the bird? Where, why aren't we eating?" He said, "You know, you know, why? Don't worry, it, it, it has to be cooked." And then from the distance, we heard this dying of, and the man, the elderly one, said, "Oh, Mahi." <laughs> so I said, "Supposing the man has missed, what then?" This is the Marli Yogi. And uh, then we heard a second time. And I knew, you know, the birds were all gone. So I said to my wife and uh, my friend, we have to get into the jeep and run for our lives. And we ran for our lives. And I tell you, this little village, the entire male population ran after us. No, 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 you stop. You have to have this uh, breakfast of uh, cooked uh, duck. Uh, I think that was the. That is my favorite story from Seth. Don't I have Seth's kind of stories from Seth? You must have something to share. Actually, uh, uh, some stories are from Kheter. Uh, you know, when I request people to please uh, take me to the to certain uh, site, you know, which is very far away, and you have to go hike into the sites. They always say, oh, you see, you cannot hike uh, that site because it's very far away and you are from, you know, from a city, town. So this is the, you know, only villagers or people from the mountain regions can go hiking uh, up in that particular uh, area. So this is like the certain stories that people sometimes avoid you to take because, you know, it consumes their time and, and they feel that uh, people who come from, uh, you know, cities and urban areas, they, uh, you know, uh, not take risks of going to some of the difficult terrains, such as some areas are not difficult, but I believe that 
Saman uh, uh, has been to uh, those areas. I think it, it is very difficult to go there. And uh, without local support, I think nobody can, uh, can dare go there. So this is some of the stories that I uh, have uh, found. Same. And this uh, also from Northern Park, because uh, I have also worked uh, in Pakistan. Particular uh, stories are from Yakistan. Uh, in Darel and Tangi. Darel and Tangi are basically uh, is Tessi in Yamar district. And now uh, people go there uh, for uh, uh, tourist purpose. And a lot of to, to, uh, tourists go there. But when I was writing in 2003 or 2004, it was very difficult. Because uh, the image uh, about uh, those people are, are very negative. You know, they say they are, you know, they kill you when you go there, they are lucky, they are notorious for, you know, looting and plundering. And this is, you know, even you cannot travel on the KKH. Uh, so these are the two ways where I have got a lot, actually. I extensively travel every corner, nook and corner of both valleys, Dara and Tagi. If anybody wanted to read more about those valleys, I mean, I focus on everything actually, on right from ethnography to the heritage, history, art, even tribes. So I think this is uh, two things one from him and other from uh, Thank you. Carry some, please. I mean, uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, I tell you a story which I have read, uh, which is a very funny travel story. And this is about Lord Mamri, who came to climb the Nanga Park in 1930s. And uh, he first, of course, went to the Viceroy's, uh, uh, the Viceroy, the Vice uh, Regal Lodge in Kashmir, where he was given uh, by the Viceroy 12 Nepalese. Soldiers to keep to guard him, and the one Raghuvi Singh, uh, also a captain from the Indian Army, and they decided to climb the Nanga So he arrives in um, the on the uh, uh, west face, which is the uh, the Kohistani face next to um, uh, well, this area that we're talking about, which is quite wide and gorgeous and so on. And uh, they start climbing uh, up the mountain. And after two or three days, as they approach it at around 16,000 feet, um, they go up a ledge and there's the wagon Lord Mamali with his hat, tie, jacket, uh, clambering up, going up along with this platoon of soldiers and that would be falling. Uh, when he suddenly comes across a local Khoistani sitting there with a bandolier, and they're sitting there and watching them this party in a very amused fashion. So they said, hey, what, what are you doing here? So he said, uh, uh, Marco, Marco, I come here to shoot the Marco. So he said, he come to 16,000 feet for shooting Marco. He said, yes. Uh, then he talked to himself and he says, what are you doing here? You want to shoot the Marco as well? There are not that many around. So they said, no, no, no. We want to go climb the Nandabha. So he said, what Nandabha is the death mountain over there? So he said, really? Why do you want to do that? So, um, uh, Mangli was a bit traversed and he said, uh, well, because it's there, you know, I have to climb it, we decided to climb it. He said, all right. But I assure you, Marco, don't go any higher than this. If you want to find Marco, you find it right here. Anyway, so Mamri writes, uh, uh, the account is written about Mamri, is that uh, he poor fellow, uh, well, he said, uh, come let me invite you to a meal. He killed the Marco, so he served him some meat. And they asked him, where do you stay? He said, in that cave over there. So he said, where are your snow boots? He said, I don't have snow boots. I have these two old blue bags which I have tied on my uh, feet and secured them with some rope. And he says, so what do you eat? Where is your rations? So he says, I told you I have shoot the marble. So every time I shoot the marble, it keeps me going for a few days. So 
<laughs> quite a news, and then this fellow says, his name was Lord Khan. So Lord Khan says to Lord Mamri, uh, Lord, could I also tag along with you? So he said, yes, if you want to. And uh, so Lord Khan apparently tagged along for another day or two when Mamri falls to his death from the Mamri Ridge, which is the uh, the west face of the Nanga uh, Pandu. And this whole party then came back. Now there are, there is, you know, there is uh, some speculation as to how he died, but uh, both Saragobi Singh and Lord Khan claim that he slipped. In fact, so that's an interesting story. Thank you. So one last question uh, before we take uh, start any questions from the audience. What do you think is the future of track riding in Pakistan? I don't think it will ever die because uh, um, after I'm gone, there will be other people who will want to see perhaps the same places uh, as I have. I, I followed Eric Shipton and Dillman and um, um, Falconer and I don't even know, remember now how many people I followed. There will be others who will be following the travel writers like uh, Zulfi. They'll want to go and see what he saw. And, uh, and this will never stop. Travel by writing is never going to end. Yes, I also agree it will not go to end. And I think there are the uh, uh, young uh, writers who are contributing a lot and uh, finding uh, new uh, sites. And uh, I must mention even uh, Harun Khalid. He has done uh, interesting, uh, you know, uh, research on shrines and uh, synthetic culture. So he has contributed a lot and there are other uh, scholars or other writers who are regularly contributing. So yes, it will not be an end. There will be more people to add more in the future. Tarisa, do you want to add anything to it? Well, just a short sentence to say as long as there is curiosity and there is human beings, they will always be curious and always want to see something new, something different from where they were born. Thank you. Uh, we can take questions from the audience. So, in 1991, I met a gentleman. I was introduced to a gentleman at a friend's place, and uh, soon we were sitting in the car and discussing books and travel, travel logs and everything. And I said, yeah, I'm impressed by a person who writes in the dog, and his name is uh, Salman Rashid. And then the gentleman said, you know, his name is Salman Rashid. And I said, it's Rashid. He said, Rashid. Finally, we had a heated argument about it, and that gentleman stood up, threw the chair, kicked out the chair, and said, how dare you call me Rashid? How dare you call me Rashid? I'm Salman Rashid, and I'm the travel writer. So I said, okay, please make amends in your uh, spelling because R A S H E E D is Rashid and you spell it slightly differently. Anyway, we get, and that is the beginning of a friendship with Salman. The next time he got into trouble with his name was when Salman Rushdie wrote that book, The Satanic Voices, and there were roars in Pakistan and people were getting very emotional. Salman was incidentally somewhere in Gilgit. And uh, he had checked into a hotel. Pakram, Pakram, Gawadar. I thought it was Gilgit. Okay, you were rescued from there. And suddenly people found out that there is some Salman Rushdie staying in, in some odd hotel. And there was a lot of trouble and he has to leave his luggage behind and that has to be retrieved later on. But his most interesting story, which I want Salman to relate now, is how did the army got rid of him or how did he got rid of the army. That's a very interesting story. And I asked him to write it in the newspaper. He did it. I want him to narrate it now. In a word, the army, I served only six and a half years in the army. I have had a very, very colorful career. <clears throat> and I must tell you this, my course mate and very dear friend, Lieutenant General, retired, Sikandar Afzal once said, yeah, you were in the middle of the past, you were in the middle of the past, you were in the middle of the past, you were in the middle of the past. So, 
I, I, I had a colorful career. I, there's too much detail in that, so I can't go into that. But like I always used to love to say is that the army was preparing their booted foot to kick me out. I jumped out of the way. That's how I left the army. My name is Adam, and uh, I have a question with uh, all of three panelists. Uh, one thing that is highlighted in travel writing is uh, loss of our loss of our uh, you know architectural heritage. Salman Sahib uh, usually write a lot about it, and uh, reading his articles is not always enjoyable. Sometimes I close the book with a heavy heart. So I want to ask: uh, Do you think? Travel writing is making an impact on saving the heritage, architectural heritage. Have you seen it in your careers that your writing has made an effect on in saving our architectural heritage? Thank you. Um, I'll answer for myself, then these uh, gentlemen can answer for themselves. Not one damn bit. It makes no difference at all. No one is bothered. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I, uh, there are many heritage sites, particularly tombs, were restored due to my writings, regular writings in these And there are a number of, you know, uh, the list of those uh, uh, restored or preserved sites can be seen on some of the uh, websites of EFT and uh, some others. So yes, it, it really had effect. You can't say that you, you can't have effect and travel writers' writings have effect uh, as far as restoration and preservation is concerned. I, uh, I don't know much about architectural heritage, but the natural heritage is definitely decimated by, uh, by tourism, really. So, uh, when you write about a certain place, how pretty it is, maybe other people want to go there. And eventually they put a, put a road through it, and once they put a road through it, then that area or that valley or that mountainside is finished. I mean, look what's happening with the geoside things. Uh, 30 years ago, you could hardly get there. And now you can drive across it in your air conditioned, you know, vehicle. And obviously there are going to be so many cars out there that they trip the open floor and destroy it. Thank you. One quick question. Hi, Gunji. I had the chance to visit Tarpaka. And you know, you, in your presentation, you mentioned a lot about heritage sites and rock art and etc. But, you know, I also, um, I traveled a little bit in, in the U.S. and uh, near Tarpaka. And I met some Aborigine tribes. Like they had their own culture, their own speech, their own religion. And I, ne I had never known anything about them. I never read anything about them. So I just wanted to ask that in your travels, have you ever, especially in Sen, have you ever encountered such, uh, meeting such people or writing about them? Or just like, do you want to? Who do you want to ask? Uh, first, yes. Salman, I think. In Tarbatar, yes, I've met these uh, Tarbari. Uh, that's what they're called, right? Uh, maybe you can uh, uh, lighten us more. They have, uh, Dhatki is a different language from uh, Sindhi. It's a bit like that, but it's a mixture of Gujarati and Sindhi and Thari. Uh, I don't understand Dhatki. I can j just barely make out what they're saying. But you can maybe enlighten us. Uh, yes, uh, uh, there are many uh, tribes. For uh, instance, Koli, Ghi, Mengwar, Ribadi, Kuchra, uh, this is long. So I, when you travel uh, uh, in Tarpatar, I'm sure you might have uh, encountered encounter or met uh, some Kolis or Mengwars or even suitors. So out of Tarpatar, if you go uh, other districts are sent, you uh, will find uh, like uh, Ravada, Nandavada, Gurghana, and these are basically different tribes and who are known for their profession. And Gurghana, they say, uh, care about tribes, 
uh, toys and uh, kabutra. Uh, basically, we are known for the you know uh, particular uh, uh, dancing. The way you know the kabutra or pigeon move, they dance like a kabutra. That's why they are they are called kabutra. And then they are pavia. So like the list is very long. There are still uh, indigenous tribes in Sen. Even old. Thank you. I think that would be a lot. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Um.